Hey everyone, welcome to the Eat Me, Drink Me podcast, where I, Audrey, and my guests will share our personal, supernatural, and mystical experiences with you. We hope our stories inspire you to follow Holy Spirit as Alice followed the white rabbit, but into Jesus's wonderland, where we get to rest in, explore, and celebrate everything that he has made available to us, not just in heaven when we die, but here on earth right now. Hey everyone, I've got a bonus episode for you today that correlates with my last episode titled Jesus as a Lion. I'm actually going to be reading a German folk tale for you today called The True Bride. The original story is a Brothers Grimm fairy tale, but the one I'm going to be reading to you today underwent a fascinating transformation by none other than Jim Henson that he revised for his TV series The Storyteller, which is where I first heard it. Through his unique alterations and the way Henson weaves the tale, you'll find the essence of the gospel shining through like never before. In my last episode, I shared instances of encountering Jesus as a lion, and while this folktale played a pivotal role in boosting my faith when I first saw it, but then again years later showing me that even life's daunting but minuscule challenges can be conquered with divine assistance. Join me as I read this whole story to you, and then I'll share with you at the end the depths of gospel mystery that can help us to see the stark contrast of living under the shroud of law versus the radiant experience of a mystical union with God and Christ's triumphant work. Let's uncover the magic within this tale and how it can breathe life into yours. The True Bride Trolls come at the bottom of the list of people you'd want as friends. They can't even stand each other. The troll in this story had a daughter, and she left home straight away. In her place, the troll found an orphan, a young girl named Anya, to wait on him hand and foot. But this girl had more in store than to do for a troll. Oh yes, she had a destiny. Now whatever the troll asked of her, Anya did. She never stopped. Dawn to dusk would clean and dust, polish and scrub, She had neither father nor mother, and the troll was the other. So she gave him her duty, cruel though he was. But one thing the troll could not stand was virtue. He did not like charity or hope or kindness or generosity, and any sort of virtue you can think of he was against. So for every delicious meal, darned shirt, gleaming floor, there would be a terrible price. A slap for the meal, a kick for the shirt, a spit for the floor. Yet woe betide Anya if these things were not done. I should have said, trolls are always contradicting themselves. And the troll liked to contradict himself with a heavy stick he kept hung on the wall. It made a horrid sound as it flew through the air onto Anya's back. Blue it contradicted on her back. Black and blue. The harder the poor child worked, the harder the tasks the troll set for her. The troll was so ugly he would have no mirror. He could not stand his own smell. He moved like a huge rat scurrying along, his tiny legs overbalanced by a head the size of a boulder. He had fat where there should have been muscle, muscle where there should have been fat, and bones in all the wrong places. He slept standing up and ate lying down. Hair grew from top to bottom and up his nose, and his teeth didn't fit in his mouth. His words came out in a jumble. His jumble came out in words. What he chewed he should have swallowed. What he swallowed, he should have chewed, and his stomach had a hole in it. He was full of contradictions. He looked at Anya and found her too willing, too nice, too sugar and spice, too much what he wanted. So he resolved to ruin her. One morning, he trotted in with a bundle of sacks and dumped them on the floor, where Anya was sleeping. I'm off without he announced, his head in the wrong direction. Inside these sacks are being twenty pounds of feathers. Clean them and pack them before I come back, he instructed and disappeared. Anya rubbed her eyes and stared bleakly at the mound of sacks. Just as she untied the first of them, the troll's huge head swung around the door. And remember, I'm being allergic to feathers. 
A single one floating in the air upsets my nose, a quivering and a quaking, a rocking and a rolling, a shimmying and a shaking, and I don't like it. So woe betide me if I be sneezed. Am I clarified? And thus confused, he shot off again. Alone with the sacks of feathers, Anya threw up her hands in despair. How could she, before the day ended, finish such a job? How could she? Soon he'd be back, the terrible troll. Soon his stick would contradict. So, trembling, wretched, she began to work. She plucked and cleaned and packed and packed, but still the feathers filled the room. Still the feathers fought the sacks. After an hour, the room was full of feathers floating. Feathers everywhere. Brave though she was, and not a little stubborn, poor Anya's heart sank. Is there no one in the whole wide world, she thought, to take pity on me? The clock chimed and shook her from her misery. Sniffing up a tear, she went back to the swirling feathers. Then she imagined that someone had called her name, and the voice she heard was rich and warm and hugged her, and spoke her name in a way that made the words seem different, for she had no father nor mother, and when people said Anya, it was always barked, hissed, yelled, or shouted. This Anya was a nice sound, and she looked round to see where it had come from. Standing in front of her was a lion, a great white lion, with a mane like snow. She gasped and fell back, terrified. The lion pad padded toward her until his head seemed to fill the room. But when he spoke again, his voice was so soothing that all Anya's fears ebbed away. Don't be frightened, he told her. I've come to help you. Where have you come from? she asked, and the lion explained that he'd come from her thoughts. Is there no one in the whole wide world to take pity on me, you thought? Well, there is. And with that, he asked of her task, and told her to sleep, and dream it done. Anya meant to say she couldn't sleep, meant to speak of the troll's threat, the terrible stick, but before she knew it, she had lain down on the flagstones, her eyelids so heavy, her dreams racing up to meet her. Before she knew it, her eyes were closed, and she was in a deep slumber. An hour later, the clock chimed and she woke, startled, full of anxiety. The first thing she saw was the contradiction stick, cold on the wall. She must work, she must get busy. But when she looked, when she noticed, when she took in the room, what a sight! What a wonder! For there before her were the sacks neatly bound, the work done, not a single feather forgotten. Oh, thank you, lion, she cried. Thank you! But the lion had gone, and in his place was the sound of scurrying she knew so well. The troll was returning. I've recurred, he announced as his head appeared, then his body, then his legs. He licked his horrid lips and skipped over to the wall to collect his stick, relishing the swoosh and thwack. Only then did he see the sacks. You've done it, he gasped, his mouth dropping. I'm gazed. I'm flabbered. I am found a dumb. Anya nodded, hardly believing it herself. He poked suspiciously at the sacks, untying one. As he did so, his nose began to quiver, his nostrils dancing. A tiny feather escaped from the sack. <laughs> he sneezed, and a cloud of feathers flew up in his face. <laughs> The next morning, the troll woke Anya before the birds had begun, or the light had appeared. Arise, wakey, he growled, shaking her. I'm having another job for you. And while Anya struggled to open her eyes, he set about locking a chain to her ankle, meantime licking the two teeth that protruded from his lower lip. He dragged the sleepy girl from the house, yanking on the chain so that she could barely keep her balance, but must hop and jump behind him the clasp biting into her flesh. Come on, come on, haven't got all daylight. And he pulled her to a pond at the back of his garden. Observe this pond. Deep, you'd say, and you'd be right. 
depth of plenty. He pulled out a ladle from his pocket and thrust it into her hand. Drain it, he ordered, his little legs rocking under the weight of his head. Drain it with this ladle. Anya looked at the ladle, then at the deep pond. If I be returning back and forth and find a single drop of water, if I so much as get my foot sweat, the troll stabbed one of his three fingers at her menacingly, then heaven help me. With that, he tied Anya's chain to a tree and skipped off with a cruel giggle. Alone, Anya bent to the pond and dipped in the ladle. As she retrieved it, the water poured through a hundred tiny holes. For the troll had given her a sieve for the task. Impossible! Impossible! She tried and tried and cried and cried until her tears raised the level of the pond more quickly than the sieved ladle could reduce it. She slumped back on the bank in despair, rubbing her eyes with her fingers. When she opened them, she was face to face with the great white lion. Oh, lion, she cried. My ladle is full of holes. My tears increase the water. You're tired, my little. Lie down and sleep a while. Anya shook her head. I dare not, she told him. For my lord the troll will beat me with his terrible stick. But even as she spoke, she felt so drowsy, so heavy, so pillow and blanket that she lay back in the grass and in a moment was asleep. And in her dream, the lion pad padded to the pond and drank and drank and drank his fill until he had drunk it dry. When she woke, Anya saw a hole where once there had been water and she could not believe it. Oh, lion, she cried. But again, he had disappeared and in due course, the troll returned. How abstractly furiating! He howled, staring at the pond. He was so bothered and bewildered that his toes ventured too near to the edge and carried him screaming into the mud. Gah! Look at me! Now I have to wash my body thing! Get me out! Get me out! And Anya dragged him out and got a beating for her pains. Oh, yes, the troll's fall cost the poor girl dear. That night, she could not sleep for the colors on her back from the contradiction stick. All night, she sobbed from its blacks and blues. And while she wept, the wicked troll raged. He raged and raged until morning he had devised a new task, an impossible task. Back, he dragged her to where the pond had been, muttering darkly, yanking on the chain. Good, very good, very brilliant. You've dried the pond wetless. Oh, yes, rather a genius. Don't know how. Anya said nothing, but held her breath in fear of what was to come. The troll scowled at the mud. Now you may build me a palace with numerous rooms and fully decored. All the bits, all the pieces by nightfall. Or else... And off he scurried, leaving Anya chained to the tree with a palace to build by nightfall. She could hear his snigger and cackle for a mile down the lane. Hours later, she'd moved a single rock a few inches. The strain of it. The pain of it. But still, she struggled, refusing to give up. Light was failing into the red and gray streaks of evening when the lion appeared. He watched the poor girl lift and drop, lift and drop, lift and drop her pile of stones. You're tired, my little, came his sonorous tones. Why not rest a while? Anya sighed. Oh, lion, I dare not, for my lord the troll will beat me until there is not a breath left in my body. Shh, sleep. And sleep she did, for his eyes lulled her. His presence soothed her. His voice rocked her gently into dreams. She thought she was dreaming. The troll had returned. How? 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 
I must wake up, she thought. I must wake up. And she willed her eyes open to escape from the fearful rage. There he was, her lord and master, crouching over her, the bile spilling from him, his face a furious red, his teeth grinding. How? He was bellowing, shaking her until her head ached. Anya began to apologize, tried to explain that she'd fallen asleep, could not have managed his impossible task, when suddenly she saw it. A palace behind them, beautiful spires tearing the dark heavens, a perfect palace where before a pond had been. How beautiful, she cried. Oh, how lovely. The troll's nostrils twitched, the three thick fingers of each hand squeezing her arm. So it wasn't you who done this, Anya answered. No, sir. Triumph stretched the troll's weird mouth into what passed for a smile. Well, that's a contradiction. And when there's being a contradiction, we should fetch our friend. Is that not the case? Anya was wretched. I don't know, she whispered. Probably. The troll skipped and lurched, all excited. Very probably. Certainly, in fact. The troll dragged Anya by the chain toward the palace. The huge walls, the stained glass, the soaring spires loomed above them. This is more like it for an important troll, he announced, and danced across the drawbridge. Inside they found delights of all descriptions. Walls hung with tapestries, chandeliers of crystal, goblets of gold, and rooms of many colors. In a great hall a fire blazed and the long table groaned with plate upon plate of a fabulous feast. The troll's eyes rolled in his head, his lips drooled, his feet jigged. Good. Um, lovely. And what about wine? He asked, hitching Anya's chain to a ring in the wall and settling down to gorge himself. The glasses and jugs seemed empty. Is there being a celery for wine? His eyes darted about and came upon a cupboard. Go and be Zig, he ordered his servant. Try that door. Anya went toward the door, but the chain pulled her up short a few feet from her destination. The troll, a whole chicken bulging out of his cheeks, the grease dribbling from the corners of his mouth, scurried over. If you want something doing, he spluttered, bits of chicken trailing behind him. Be doing it yourself. He reached the door, opened it, and peered into the dark. "'Let me fetch you a light,' offered Anya, hurrying to the table where the candles flickered. The troll puffed up with conceit. "'A troll can see perfectly clarified,' he told her, and walked into the shadows. Anya heard a terrible cry, which dropped away from her, echoing into the bowels of the palace, as the troll fell and fell and landed with a dreadful thump. Anya, horrified, ran to the door, but again the chain held her back. Straining at the chain, looking frantically about her, she saw the lion appear from nowhere. Oh, lion! Quick, quick! she cried. My lord, the troll, is in terrible trouble. The lion pad padded toward her. I know, he said, and with a single flick of his paw shattered the chains that held her. Anya ran to the table, fetched a candle, and took it to the door. Holding the flame to the dark, she looked down and down. Poor troll, she whispered sadly. No father, nor mother, and he was my other. Not poor, my little, but wicked and cruel. I made the palace. I also made the door. And saying this, he blew against the door, which vanished. The wall closed up, leaving in its place a small portrait of the troll. And so Anya found herself mistress of the marvelous palace. Upstairs dresses, downstairs food, servants everywhere. What a transformation! One minute at the mercy of a wicked troll, a princess the next. At the end of a long corridor she found a room lined in velvet, where beautiful gowns lay waiting for her. 
in the next chamber a hot bath drawn, rich with aromatic scents, and a sandalwood box with pearls for her throat, diamonds for her ears, gold for her fingers. Anya lay soaking away her past for hours and hours, and then dressed herself, pinning up her hair. When later she walked back down the corridor, passing a long mirror, she blushed and curtsied, feeling sure she had met a princess, until she realized this beauty before her was her own reflection. So she curtsied again, smiled, and laughed, and danced. For the first time in her life, she felt wonderful. And thus it was that a new life began for Anya. The days blessed her, the nights caressed her, the weeks sailed peacefully into months, and her beauty blossomed. So the story goes on, and it has a beautiful love story, with another parallel about remembering who we are, walking out our identity in Christ, and about true love. So I encourage you guys to go check it out. You can watch it on Amazon, or you can order the book. It's super fascinating and fun to watch and fun to read. I'll post the links in the description. All right, so now we will unpack the gospel truths woven into this story. We start with hearing that Anya had more to her life than to be a slave for the troll, and that she had a destiny. Destiny suggests more than just a predetermined future. It implies a future filled with great purpose and meaning. We all have a unique destiny, but it can be difficult for many people to truly believe in their destiny. When faced with past mistakes or feelings of insignificance, it's easy to feel like we've missed our chance. But God's love is unchanging. His mercy is new every day. He is for us, not against us. Even when we can't believe in ourselves, God believes in us. The very word destiny means to appoint, to determine, to stand firm with purpose. Our primary destiny is simply to be loved by God and to love others. We were created by love, for love. No matter what we've done, God's love appoints us, gives us purpose, and determines our true identity. Jesus, who is love embodied, stands firm in his unshakable, steadfast love for us. We each have a destiny filled with meaning because we are each truly and deeply loved. Okay, then we read about the contradiction stick and how the troll uses it to beat Anya when she did what he asked, even when she did it well, because he was always trying to find a way to criticize her. The harder the poor child worked, the harder the tasks the troll set for her. The troll and his contradiction stick represent living under the law of sin and death. In Romans 7, Paul says, If my behavior contradicts my desires to do good, I must conclude that it's not my true identity doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin hindering me from being who I really am. Through my experience of this principle, I discover that even when I want to do good, evil is ready to sabotage me. Truly deep within my true identity, I love to do what pleases God, but I discern another power operating in my humanity, waging a war against the moral principles of my conscience and bringing me into captivity as a prisoner to the law of sin this unwelcome intruder in my humanity. What an agonizing situation I am in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? And in the true bride story, Anya thinks to herself, is there no one in the whole wide world to take pity on me? It's the same heart, don't you see? And just like how Paul ends Romans 7 with saying, I give all my thanks to God, for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. Anya is then met by the white lion that has come to help her to rest and to set her free from living a life of condemnation and being ruled by the evil troll. It's very common that when we begin to try to live a good life by our own understanding, things keep knocking us down. People take advantage of us. It feels like life is going against the grain, which is very contradicting, right? And even in our walk of faith, we experience so much seeming contradiction 
that some people go on to believe that God doesn't work miracles anymore, or that he's holding back on them, that he loves some people more than others. Many people are told to just be a good little boy and a good little girl, then they will be saved and go to heaven when they die. We often hear from the pulpit that life will always be hard until we die, and we will always struggle with sin because we are sinners. But just as the lion came to Anya and the troll was cast away from her life and she was free from condemnation, from fear, from living as an orphan into being a princess, Jesus came to set us free from the law of sin and death, darkness and condemnation. Colossians 1.13 says, He has rescued, he has, past tense, rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. And Romans 7 verses 5 and 6 say, When we were merely living natural lives, the law actually awakened sin within us, which resulted in bearing the fruit of death. But now that we have been fully released from the power of the law, we are dead to what once controlled us, and our lives are no longer motivated by the obsolete way of following the written code, so that now we may serve God by living in the freshness of a new life in the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, it's so good. He is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Another parallel to point out is how the lion is working miracles seemingly through Anya as she just rests and you would hope that it would change the heart of the troll, but it doesn't. It just infuriates him even more, just like the teachers of the law became infuriated towards Jesus and his followers to the point of demonizing him, falsely accusing him, crucifying him, and persecuting his followers. No matter how many miracles were performed, their hearts were stone. Yet Jesus kept giving them opportunities to repent and to see him differently so they too could experience his kingdom on earth. And there could have been hope for the troll as well, but his heart was stone and he was full of contradiction just as the teachers of the law studied the scriptures and knew all the prophecies of the coming Messiah. Yet their leaders crucified him instead of seeing him for who he really was, even when his arms were still outstretched to them on the cross. Okay, so back to the story. We then see the lion break Anya's chains that the troll put on her, and she sees the troll fall through a door. She feels sad because even though the troll abused her, he was all she had. There are so many people in the world who stay in relationships, friendships, and even parental situations where they are being abused physically, mentally, and emotionally, and they stay with them because the other is all they know, or they don't want to be alone. So they would rather stay in the abuse than to live alone or not have friends, because really, they usually can't experience much peace because of the mindset of is not founded in God's love or their identity in Christ. This mindset is also prevalent in the church of today, people thinking they are dumb sheep and need the pastor's interpretation instead of reading it themselves with Holy Spirit. They are not founded in God's love and their identity in Christ. But as we see Jesus more for who he really is, we will see ourselves for who he says we really are. And he will help us during times of loneliness, grief, how to stand up for what is right and how to value ourselves. He will romance us. He will give us gifts. He will teach us. He will lead us. So in the rest of the story that we didn't read to you, but you can go watch or read for yourself, Anya goes on to meet a gardener who becomes her prince. But one day, before they're married, he is on his way into town, and he is put under a spell by the troll's daughter called the Trollop, and she takes him to a far-off land where she plans to marry him. Anya goes to look for him, and the lion finds her, 
and she rides on his back across the world to find her love. And when they land, he gives her three walnuts with gifts inside and tells her to use them wisely. When she finds her prince to be, she sees that he does not even recognize her. Then she is horrified at seeing the trollop, and instead of listening to fear, she resolves in herself that she is the true bride. She is his true bride, and he is her beloved. So she goes on to use the walnuts, which have been used to symbolize the importance of wisdom and discernment in many religious traditions over the centuries. Christianity values discernment as the means to develop awareness and understanding prior to taking action. Therefore, to practice discernment, we must possess wisdom. So the lion has given Anya wisdom, and here we see an example of a believer after encountering freedom in Christ, but then is in the situation where someone she cares about is a victim to the darkness she once lived under. So now she uses discernment and wisdom given to her from the lion to outwit the trollop, set her beloved free from the curse, and they ride together on the lion's back, back home, and they got married. But one night, while they were asleep, the trollop shows up with plans to destroy them. But the lion casts the trollop away with her father, and the couple never even knew. Isaiah 54 verse 17 says, No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment you shall show to be in the wrong. This peace, righteousness, security, triumph over opposition is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. This is the righteousness and the vindication which they obtain from me. This is that which I impart to them as their justification, says the Lord. So this gospel reveal through this story circles around back to the revelation of destiny. Even the name Anya means grace and strength. Her destiny was with her, in her, all along. Just like Jesus is with us and in us all along, even before we believe it. But when we do receive and believe, we are transformed and see the fruit of light and truth in our lives because we don't lean on our own understanding. We acknowledge God in all our ways, and Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit direct our path, but we no longer live against the grain anymore. I bless you to rest in this reality, and I tell you, friend, you can let go of your fears, expectations, dreams, goals, everything you are stressfully striving for, so that He can take your hand and guide your path into a life greater than you can ask, think, or even imagine. And I don't say that to say, give up on your dreams. But what I'm saying is that it's not all on you to make it happen. I'm going to end with reading Romans 8, 28-39. And I pray that the eyes of your heart and mind are opened to seeing, hearing, feeling, receiving, rejoicing in, and acknowledging every word as ultimate truth, so that you may walk in freedom with Christ as a new creation in the Beloved. Hallelujah. So, we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good, for we are His lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. For he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his Son. This means the Son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone. And those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his Son. So what does all this mean? If God is determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, 
the gift of his Son, and since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. Who then would dare to accuse those whom God has chosen in love to be his? God himself is the judge, who has already issued his final verdict over them. Not guilty. Who then is left to condemn us? Certainly not Jesus, the anointed one, for he is the one that gave his life for us. And even more than that, he has conquered death and is now risen, exalted, and enthroned by God at his right hand. So how could he possibly condemn us since he is continually praying for our triumph? Who could ever divorce us from the endless love of God's anointed one? I also want to add in there, orphan us. Who could ever orphan us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats? Nope. They are all impotent to hinder omnipotent love. Even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us to be more than conquerors, and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is absolutely nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. (laughs) I feel like I'm going to cry. Just soak that up, everyone. I love you. I bless you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a beautiful day. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and if you did, please consider supporting us. We need your help to spread the not-too-good-to-be-true message of Christ's finished work. So to show your support, you can visit our website at eatmedrinkmepodcast.net where you can join our community on Facebook and Discord. You can subscribe for emails, leave a review, and you can check out our store where you can find happy Jesus-inspired clothing, accessories, and artwork from me and my wild husband, John. We are truly grateful for your contributions, your support, and your prayers. May God bless you all with endless joy and wonder. I feel so seen by you.